So, um, a very warm welcome to this evening's Maddingley Lecture. I'm Rebecca Lingwood, I'm the Director of the Institute of Continuing Education here at Maddingley Hall, and I'm really delighted that this evening we've got Lord Brown as Speaker and also the Vice-Chancellor in the Chair. Um, so, briefly, just to introduce the Vice-Chancellor to you, Sir Lezek, um, was installed as the 345th Vice-Chancellor of the University of Cambridge on the 1st of October 2010, so just celebrated the fourth anniversary of his appointment. Um, he was previously Chief Executive of the UK's Medical Research Council, and prior to that, um, he was at Imperial College London as Principal of the Faculty of Medicine and later as Deputy Rector. Earlier in his career, he was lecturer in medicine here at Cambridge and went on to be professor of medicine at the University of Wales in Cardiff, where he led pi pioneering work on vaccines, principally for the human papillomavirus, for which he was knighted in 2001. Um, he was a founding fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and he became a fellow of the Royal Society in 2008. So just before I hand over to the Vice-Chancellor to introduce Lord Brown, could I remind you if you've got mobile phones with you or anything else which may go off during the course of the next hour or so, um, could you please turn them off or to silent at this point? Thank you very much. So welcome, Vice-Chancellor. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome this evening, and uh, we're really honoured to have uh, Lord, uh, Lord Brown here, who's agreed to speak uh, in what is very aptly entitled the Maddingley Lecture Series. These lectures are actually aimed to engage the public on a wide range of topical subjects. And this evening, Lord Brown has uh, agreed to address us on the topic of gay businessmen and women, and why they choose to remain closeted at work. Our lecturer has an illustrious background in the business world. Lord Brown joined BP as an apprentice in 1966 while still a student at the University of Cambridge. I was trying to look up actually whether you were allowed to be paid as an apprentice while you were at the university, but uh, I couldn't find the appropriate statutes. <laughs> and he worked his way up through the company in a number of senior positions before becoming chief executive officer in 1995. He was responsible for transforming BP into one of the world's largest companies during his tenure as Chief Executive Officer. Lord Brown holds degrees from Cambridge and from Stanford and has received a number of honorary degrees from universities around the world. He was the President of the Royal Academy of Engineering and is a Fellow of the Royal Society, a foreign member of the United States Academy of Arts and Sciences and Chairman of the trustees of the Tate Galleries. He was knighted in 1998 and made a life peer in 2001. Lord Brown has long been a supporter of the University of Cambridge. He served Cambridge uh, as the, uh, the chairman of the Cambridge Judge Advisory Board for many years and continues to support St John's MBA students at the business school. The University of Cambridge's mission is to contribute to society and to do so by demonstrating in everything we do, we do at the highest possible level of excellence. Throughout his career, and again now, Lord Brown has lived that mission, contributing to society, and doing so with unwavering determination and focus. But there is one more thing the university and he share in common, something that is hugely valuable in this modern world. And that can be summed up in a single word, integrity. John, over to you. Uh, Vice-Chancellor, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. I, I thought I'd spend maybe uh, less than half our time together, if that's okay with you talking, uh, and then maybe we could have a little dialogue together and answer any questions and elaborate a bit more on what I'm talking about. Um, it was uh, in uh, uh, May, May the 1st, a very important day in the international calendar uh, of 2007, uh, that I was outed as gay and resigned on that same day as chief executive of BP. 
Uh, and uh, it's taken me a little while to think about that uh, and try and put it in perspective. And a very great friend of mine, who turns out to be a publisher, so you may think that this has an ulterior motive, spent several years uh, talking to me saying, write a book. Write a book, uh, and uh, write a book which might be helpful to just one person in the world, maybe one or two more. And write a book about what happened to you, uh, and maybe go forward uh, on that. So I decided to think about writing a book about something I knew, which was about being gay in business, LGBT people in the corporate world, not in society generally, because I'm not qualified to do that, uh, not in uh, arts and education, but in the corporate world. And probably big institutions are included in that definition of corporate. So I started by asking myself, was there a role for this book? Could I talk about myself in order to stop people getting into the same twist as I got into? Could I find people who actually had worked a very interesting life of their own and done something which gives those people who are frightened of their sexuality some confidence to be themselves, role models? And could I speak to the world at large because after all, the vast majority of the world is straight, could I talk to them and say, here are a few things you might want to think about to make the world safer, better, and more inclusive for the LGBT part of the world. So I, I thought that maybe those were the objectives of this book. So I kept asking myself, but are we in a post-gay world? That's a phrase that a lot of my friends at Google keep talking to me about. They say, well, we may be post-gay, you know, whatever that means. Uh, but uh, it sounds good. Uh, and so we, uh, we may be in that. But actually, I, I answered the question this way. I looked at the number of... Uh, I said, let's find an out gay CEO of a large company. And when I started writing this book, I looked... And you can look at the uh, S&P list of big companies in the United States, or the Fortune list, and you have to go down to company number 723 to find an out gay CEO. Now, I thought, therefore, there are 722 companies that have no out gay CEO. The statistics in the world indicate this is unlikely. Something has happened. And could it be that people are worried about being themselves? Is there a lack of authenticity? So those were the reasons. And let me, I want to go step by step through this, if I can, just to make three additional points. First, about me. Secondly, about role models. Thirdly, about leaders and, and why this is so important. So a little bit about me. Uh, I... Um, I, I was, as Boris said, I, I, I was here at university in the 60s, which meant I was born in the 40s, uh, which meant when I came up to Cambridge, uh, the Wolfenden Report, uh, which uh, legalised homosexual acts between men uh, of a consenting age, had not yet been brought into law. And there were plenty of people who had been blackmailed, bullied or otherwise pushed around uh, for being gay because it was a great way of dominating somebody, to know a secret. So that obviously started off my life by saying, it's not a good idea for people to know about me and about my, my, my authentic self. Secondly, I had a, a mother, <clears throat> long dead, who uh, was a, a survivor from Auschwitz. Uh, she survived. Uh, and uh, she had a couple of rules of life which were pretty simple uh, and straightforward. They were, number one, if you've got a secret, never tell anybody, because the moment you tell one person, it's no longer a secret. And number two, never be an identified member of a minority, because minorities are always hurt when the going gets tough. When the majority needs something, they hurt the minority. And as far as she's concerned, that was absolutely proven. 
And so this was drummed into me. So as I was growing up, it was very clear to me that I was going to have two lives. I was going to have a life which was very standard and a life which was gay whenever possible, which was rarely. And this was quite good fun. When I started work, I thought it was almost like being James Bond. You could have a legend and you could have the reality, you know, it was great. And actually that lasted a long time and it, it, I kept doing it and occasionally the two lives would come back together and they'd be like an electric shock and you'd worry terribly whether your secret had been somehow discovered. And curiously, I didn't watch anything else. I just invested in these lives and the investment got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and so it became very difficult to run these two lives, especially when I became very well known. And so when you become well known, the paranoia about being found out expands exponentially, it's huge. You know that every time you go out, someone will see you doing something. They may not care, but you are convinced that they do. And so I then, uh, st I met, I decided, well, after my mother died, I was still very sad and lonely. And so I met someone on an on escort dating service website. And I made a relationship with him. It was the most foolish thing, terribly foolish. And if you think about it, Rather than reduce risks, this might be the most risky thing you could do. But it's what you think to yourself. It's not what other people think. So I did that, and, and I, I spent some time with him. Then we broke up. My secret was secure as far as I was concerned. Uh, and then one day, I suddenly got a call uh, on a Friday evening, as you do, uh, from the Daily Mail to say that uh, this man had uh, sold our story to them, and they were going to publish it, and could I answer the following 29 questions? So I panicked, uh, and then I decided that this was really an invasion of my privacy, so I, I got some lawyers, talked to lawyers, took out a, a super injunction, uh, and in so doing, I made a fatal error. I actually told a lie about how we'd met, because I couldn't bring myself to speak to these lawyers I'd never met in my life which is something I corrected 10 days later, but that's too late. But anyway, this legal process went on and on and on. During this process, I couldn't speak to anyone. It was a contempt of court. Uh, and I decided at that moment that, well, let's see what happens. But if it came out, it was clear I had to resign and start life again, which is exactly what I did. I tell this story because it has so many characteristics uh, of things I've seen in other people. Great, great fear, great concerns that everyone can see you doing everything and you must hide everything away. Great concerns to keep privacy uh, to yourself beyond all reason, beyond all reason. It was pretty obvious, I think, as people told me, uh, as I was talking actually in Ch the Cheltenham Literary Festival on, on Saturday, uh, and a man in the audience said, you know, I was in the oil and gas business, and we all knew you were gay and we didn't mind. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, people know, but you don't know. So that's a little bit about me uh, and, and what happened. Uh, and I, th I think I learned uh, quite a lot about that, about my regrets about being not, not being authentic uh, and uh, always thinking what else I could have done had I been authentic uh, as a leader of BP in this area. Most people, uh, I spoke to a, a friend of mine in San Francisco, in fact, the wife of a friend of mine who I'd known since the time of being in America in the 70s. Uh, she said, well, we always knew there was something wrong because even for an Englishman, you were the definition of reserved. Uh, and uh, there's always a reason why people are that reserved. She then proceeded to tell me that she was bisexual uh, and uh, that she was the editor of the Campaign for Homosexual Equalities magazine in 1972 called Lunch in London, which I immediately went and bought to find out uh, these extraordinary articles, which were very, uh, they could have been written today, uh, about uh, what was needed to be done. So my second point is the question of other people. What, what, what's going on? 
So I decided this book needed uh, a, a lot of air uh, and to talk to a lot of people in different walks of life in business. And I, of course, went to people who were, first of all, out, and, and many of them were not as old as I am, but maybe they were certainly, uh, they were well over 40. And uh, so, uh, and there were some fantastic and incredible stories about what people had done and what they'd learned. Uh, in America, there was a woman who uh, worked for a defense contractor, and she eventually came out, and her, her, her company helped her, and she talked to the straight people around her and said, I want you to imagine the following. Go back to your office, take off your wedding ring, put away all your photographs of all your family, uh, don't talk about what you did at the weekend, and make sure you change he to she and she to he, and if your partner is sick, uh, you have to remember you can't actually go and see them in hospital in certain states of the United States. So, and she said, just that, that's the story. That's really the feeling and the story. But there were a lot of stories which were about people coming out, and I thought that they created a sense of confidence that it's safe to come out so long as the organization you're in deeply believes that inclusion is an important part of business, and a really important part. And that can be demonstrated. I mean, clearly all these studies about great companies where people are engaged, they come home, they come to work as themselves, they all have uh, returns which exceed the average returns of companies where people are not themselves and not engaged. And study after study has shown that. But the surprising thing was that uh, I met a lot of uh, younger people who were out in private life and they absolutely wanted to avoid anything in business. And their view was that it would get in the way of promotion, that it would be a sign of weakness, and that actually it was a sign, it was possibly an area where people could bully or otherwise influence them to do things that they didn't really want to do. And this wasn't just one or two people. In fact, there was a very large number of people. In my book, there are plenty of interviews like that, but there are even more which left on the cutting room floor because people wouldn't be identified. And there's a limit to the number of anonymous interviews you, anyone's prepared to read uh, because most people then think maybe they're just made up. But actually, they weren't. There were a large number of people who didn't want to be seen being interviewed. I mean, very complicated chases around different cafes. Uh, there were people who were really quite extreme. Uh, when we read the interviews back to them, someone said, I said, well, we are identifying you as a, a banker in London. And they said, you can't say that. People will know who I am. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of bankers in London. There are plenty of bankers in London. So it's just a demonstration that things aren't quite right. We then went, uh, I did a lot of work talking to uh, uh, networks of gay LGBT people in companies, companies that the leader has made well-meaning statements about inclusion. And of course, people find out that actually people don't participate. They don't participate in making the place inclusive. The words fall on deaf ears, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But I wanted to collect these stories so that people could gain not copycat ideas, but little ideas to say, actually, there is a way of really being myself and being authentic. The third and final point I make is, uh, what does this take? Well, as a businessman, you know, I can't write, uh, I can't write anything which says there's a problem without uh, being arrogant enough or brave enough to say, and what's more, there's a solution, uh, because that's what I'm trained to do, partly as an engineer, partly as a businessman. A and so I decided in the book to write a letter, uh, a, a debating letter to the straight people of the world, saying there are some things here that need to be thought through. And in my experience, this sort of very complicated area, nothing works until there is a strong signal from the top. The tone from the top is so important. The tone has to be not just because it's right, 
That, of course, is the underlying reason. But it has to be, I think, rationalised as good for business. Otherwise, it has no space in a crowded agenda. And that can be demonstrated again and again, both anecdotally and, and by lots of surveys, which are pretty good. And it has to be something that's repeated frequently. And finally, it has to be something, when you say you're going to do something, it absolutely has to be measured somehow. Because if it's not measured, it just disappears into the ether. And so I, I talk to people about that and about how to work with uh, managers throughout the ranks to really do the, this. I think my experience is speaking to managers, when you, when you ask them to do something, they all take it seriously and say, it's great, John, but now that's the 89th thing you've asked me to do. What do I do to prioritize my time? And you have to make space for something as important as inclusive behaviors, inclusion in everyone's agenda. Otherwise, it just won't, won't appear through the organization. So secondly, and, and then therefore you can measure it in order to reinforce that. And you measure through surveys and things like that. Very few people do that. Very, very few people do it. Secondly, it is about telling stories and about role models. Without role models, it's very difficult for people to know whether it's actually true that it doesn't get in the way of promotion uh, to be out at work. Uh, how do you know if there's no, no proof, no, no person you can identify? And how do you know you don't get beaten up? And how do you know you don't uh, lose all your friends? I mean, all those sorts of fears I had, uh, and they were just not true. Uh, but you need role models, and therefore you need stories about role models. And if there's one thing I'd like to try and do is keep generating those stories, which I do on a, a website called glassclosetorg but also throughout your other organizations. It's really to understand how that is done. Uh, and finally, I think it is simply to make sure that in thinking about anything the organization does, it bears in mind strongly the need to include and be safe. So you have to make sure that everyone feels safe to be included. A little story, therefore, about that, which was um, we came, I came across with my researcher uh, a group of young women who wanted to be interviewed. And they said, well, we, we're, we're actually not gay, we're straight women. Uh, and, uh, but they'd been to all these uh, recruitment fairs for uh, businesses. And they were doing something rather odd. They were actually simply looking at how the policies on LGBT people were being implemented by companies. And their argument was that if you get that right, then you're going to handle gender better. It was a sort of leading indicator uh, that people thought about uh, and that made them feel uh, that, um, that things were, were right. Having said all this, I think uh, compared with uh, 1966, uh, the situation is extraordinarily better. There's a very great uh, movement afoot to make things better, and make people authentic at work, to really be authentic and therefore be, be better. Uh, but uh, in, the friends of, in the words of one of my friends, who's a, one of our Lord Justices, he always said, however good things are, constant vigilance is needed. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I need to say at the moment. I've got a dialogue, so dialogue. I think you need a microphone, I, I think. Hello, this is on Grant. Um, I'm just wondering, you didn't elaborate much on why you felt you instantly had to resign. I, I think, I guess, maybe having grown up and having been lucky enough to grow up in a time when things are a lot more liberal, unlike when you were growing up, to me that almost doesn't compute. I'm like, why, why would that be your instant... Conclusion: Did anybody push you to do that, or was it just all, as you say, all the paranoia in your head that was like, that's the only way? 
Well, first, it's 2007, and I do think some things have changed in the last seven or eight years. Uh, but it was clear to me that, uh, first, uh, the circumstances of the build-up to the exposure were not good. Uh, I think that, that, that I felt very bad about it all. Secondly, I didn't want to take the company through uh, an extraordinary time when people might have said, why hasn't he gone? Why hasn't he gone? Uh, and that would be very destructive. So, and thirdly, therefore, I said, I just have to go. A and I didn't ask anyone. I didn't ask the board. I had a letter prepared. Uh, I was given 24 hours notice with the judgment coming out of seal. Um, and it came out, and I had the letter delivered. Uh, I just had the letter delivered to the chairman of the board. I didn't even deliver it. A and I walked out of BP. Well, I walked out of BP a few hours later. Security said, You've, we've got to, we need to do some things before you can go. Um, and I walked out of the front door to the very large number of press from all over the world who made me the subject of their interest for the next three days uh, on motorbikes and long focus lenses and I was, I, mean, I think I was in probably every single newspaper of the world for, for about three days. And then I, you know, the dogs barked and the caravan moved on. But, uh, but uh, that's, so that's why I did it. I mean, it seemed to me to me very clear. Now, uh, and I think it is important to, uh, I, I suppose, <clears throat> you know, these decisions are not wholly rational. Uh, you, you have to feel the situation. And I suppose if I take a very... Uh, rational approach, which I don't think I did at the time, uh, I'd say, well, I also felt bad about not being myself for all the teams that I led. And I felt bad about that. Thank you. Um, you talked a lot about the importance of inclusion within the corporate world, but corporations such as the one that you have worked for, um, are also global. And I just wondered if you had any reflections in how an inclusive corporation can act when it has to work within contexts and cultures where LGBT issues are, how can I put it, far more yeah. problematic. Um, sure. The obvious question is, you know, how do you work in Uganda or, yeah, or yeah. actually Russia nowadays? Yeah. Uh, well, I think first you have to reflect on the fact that there are 77 countries in the world where to do anything to either promote homosexuality or take a homosexual act, do a homosexual act, can get you in jail or executed. I think six places you can be executed. Half those countries are um, former members of the British Empire. So they, we actually exported the laws sort of version 1.0, as it were, and they never got updated. So there's a real problem with that. And so there's a lot of former British colonies and empire, components of the empire, where this is illegal. So I think the following. First, no company, no corporation can change the laws in any other country. The best you can do is do a little economic nudging, which I think everybody does do, the big agenda of every CEO is to change everything. You can't do that. Uh, but what you can do is to keep pushing. And one way of pushing, if you have a chance to take expatriate staff and bring them into a country, is to bring, for example, a gay leader into Uganda. And if they're foreigners, they will almost certainly be much more protected than a local person. And it'll demonstrate that that's what you intend to do. And no one's going to stop you doing that as long as she or he does not break the law of the land when they get there. In order to do that, you've got to know who's, who's out and gay, who's gay, otherwise you could make terrible mistakes and you need to brief people and think about it. For the local staff, uh, IBM have done uh, a lot of work in this area and probably some of the best. They've always said that their ideal situation is within the walls of their corporation, wherever they are, it's a safe place to come out. I think it's not quite as easy as that because, for example, if you were in Uganda 
and you came out in the office and someone was there who wanted to make mischief, would tell someone in the outside world that she is gay or he is gay, then you might get beaten up the moment you leave the office. Uh, you might or might get blackmailed. So it's not as easy as it may think. I think things can be done. I think it can move forward. Of course, there's a whole pile of other activity to do with uh, um, Human Dignity Trust and all the activities they do in, you know, in somehow pursuing human rights for LGBT people in these countries. Uh, and that's great work. John, you've touched on uh, an issue which I think is very important in any large organization. This university is a large organization. You have to permeate that culture through the organization. But there's, there's something that very often I feel in relationship to this. We've reached a sort of point with many of these issues where we can all do the PC thing. We can all do the politically correct verbiage and the, the rules and the, the sure. regulations are all there. But that change of culture in relationship to LGBT issues, or for that matter, gender or ethnicity, is so much more difficult when you try and pervade all aspects of an organization. From your experience and looking back, are there lessons that you would have learned directly from your experience on how you would have done things differently at PP, and that we could take yeah. away and actually learn a little bit about in a complex organization like the university? Well, I think, um you know, the, my, my track record in BP in this area is very mixed, but it was very strong, I think, in inclusion. And I'll come back to tell you a story about that in a moment. But I do think, like everything uh, that you need to get done, you need to justify, as a leader, why you're doing it. Now, most, I think, CEOs, and I expect most vice chancellors, will say, my most important asset are my people. Great. Isn't that right? So I would interpret that as saying, well, at least 50% of my time should be on people. So examine the time allocation of the real and actual time allocation of people. It's nowhere near that. It's nowhere near it. So you have to re-examine, I think, what people actually do day to day first. Because if you can't get the time, you can't get the traction. You've just got to get the time. And you've got to sit with uh, managers and say, you know, I want to talk to you about what you're doing and why it's so important that we do this, because this is about our people, it's about making them feel really engaged with the work, really, really engaged, and not having half their brain occupied pretending to be somebody else. And whether that is to solve, a, solve to get a better gender balance, to get a better LGBT balance, I mean, it's all the same. And we're not doing well. I mean, I look at, uh, in the corporate area, yeah. you know, there, now we've got 20% women on boards, which is good, but actually not relevant. Because if you look at the next level down, which is the executive and management committees of corporations, it's 6%. That's where the real decisions are made. That's where the real power exists, and that's where the real change can happen. It's not going to happen at a board level. It never does. It never does. And so it seems to me, you know, I'm all with you. I hate the PC stuff. I particularly hate it when it becomes compliance activity, you know, fill in a form for, uh, you know, some, some department of government, whether it's in the US or here, to demonstrate that you're doing the right thing. Uh, it, because then people think that's all you need to do. And actually this is about real people uh, and it's really uh, it's, it's something that that cannot be done with forms and it cannot be done with delegation simply to an expert group you know like human resources so my story about BP so I decided that we would take a big leaf uh, uh, out of uh, the best companies in the world and figure out how we could get more diversity and more inclusion in uh, uh, an industry which was hallmarked with macho behavior, alpha males, bad places to work, big John Wayne characters, you, you name it. Uh, and so we decided to do this and I recruited an extraordinary woman from the United States, from, actually from uh, Bristol Mars Squibb, uh, who was an African-American woman 
who did diversity and inclusion, and we got to know her. And I made her a report directly to me, which was kind of unusual. And I said, well, we're going to do this. We're going to do it step by step. We'll figure out something somewhere, and we'll go and try and solve easy problems first and leave the tough ones to later, because hopefully we'll have fellow travelers you know, coming along. So after a few years, I was invited to give a speech at a, uh, at a conference, I've forgotten, somewhere in Europe, uh, about uh, how, what does inclusion mean. So I, I rather enormous risk to myself, there was no risk at all, but in my head it was. I said, you know, and this is going to cover uh, gay people as well. We're going to make sure that we have a level playing field and a safe place to work and stuff. So the very next day, The Guardian had a headline which said, BP chief to recruit gays. <laughs> so that was 2002. So it, it shows you actually how far we've gone. So this is The Guardian, right? I mean, this is not The Telegraph. Uh, and uh, in 2002, created a headline like that. Now, do you think anyone would do that today? I don't think so. Uh, but then it was unusual. But I do think this getting, you know, when you want to make a change like this, you have to be, drive it from the top, which means whoever's doing it has to report directly to the person in charge, and the person in charge has to spend time with their direct reports, saying how we're gonna do this with time and how you're gonna do it with time with other people, otherwise it goes nowhere. It sounds great, but nothing happens. Uh, uh, because it was the only one left, actually. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, so I, I went to, uh, when you be I became a peer, I mean, there, there were many fewer peers when I became a peer. Uh, uh, they're rather, almost double the number now uh, in the house. Uh, but I had to go and see someone called Garter King of Arms, and the poor man I saw is now dead. But it was well known that uh, after lunch was not as good as before. Uh, and so I went to see him after lunch, and he indeed was, had, was very red. Uh, and uh, so I, he said, well, his, I remember his opening line so well. He said, I have created, I have created 250 peers, and I won't have any nonsense. That was the first, so I was really immediately put in my place. Uh, and uh, then he said, now, you've obviously thought about a title, what's it going to be? So I, so I started going through my life, you know, I said, well, Ely. And he said, good God, it's a bishop. You know, and I said, Cambridge, he said, reserved for a duke. Uh, and then I said, Chelsea, and he said, overused. So I said, well, you know, so I owned a house on Maddingley Road. So I said, Maddingley? and there was a pause, and then he pushed a button under his desk, and a very harried woman came in, and she was given a piece of paper written, I saw, in a blue pencil with this title. And he, then he didn't say anything, and changed the subject and said, now, you'll be wanting a coat of arms, and this is how much we charge for it. So it was the, it was the sales pitch, and then she came back, uh, and silently gave him a message, and he said, Her Majesty will grant this, you know, and that was it. That was it. So, but actually, I'm very pleased, and uh, so it's, uh, it's, you know, I, I spent a lot of my childhood before I went to school here, and, uh, and then obviously I went to university. I feel very fondly about Cambridge, and Madding is the closest I can get, and Madding is a great place. Good restaurant. Firstly, I'd just like to say how much I loved your book. Um, I picked it up because a friend of mine is one of your interviewees and in the end just read it straight through. It was so fascinating, so um, thank you for that. One thing that struck me in reading it, though, was that the people talked, obviously, about their experiences of coming out. I don't think a single interviewee talked about their own children or their own family relationship. I'm not, I don't mean parents, but you know, having children, having partners, having families at home. And I wondered what, whether this was because it just didn't come up as an issue or they weren't asked um, why 
no, that side no, of their lives wasn't. In fact, there were interviews like that, but but in line with you know disciplined approach, you have to say I'm dealing with institutional behaviour, and I'm writing a book about that. Otherwise, we'll, you could go off. I mean, we had some fascinating. I mean, there are plenty of. Uh, I think I, I went to another literary festival, so parents will come up to me and say, Could you write this book out to Jane or to John? Because we'd like them to come out, and they're their sons and daughters, which is very interesting. So, the, the, obviously, they've talked about it in the family, but the parents are, are more keen to make this happen than the children, which is, is it very interesting. So we had conversations like that, much as we had conversations with sports personalities, and you know, some of which are in the book, but they're really demonstrating uh, behavior of the individual and the organization. So Martina compared with Billy Jean, uh, it's that sort of thing. And, uh, and stories you know, about, I mean, uh, since there are virtually there are no gay footballers, it seems, um, you know, the one or two who've come out when they've retired, you know, we interviewed one extensively to try and understand, you know, because that's part of being in a small company, small company called a team, what's the, what's the issue here? Uh, and the book, I think, explains that, it tries to. But I, I wish there were, there were plenty of other things we could have covered. Um, and thank you for that incredibly articulate talk as well. Um, I, I wanted to ask you about the group of women who were looking for companies that have strong LGBT policies because they thought it might be better for them because they felt if those policies were right, the gender policies might be right. Um, so I was wondering, first of all, how might they know um, when they were at the fair, you know, whether the policy was actually a good policy or whether, as you said, it was just sort of box ticking and making noises but, but not really getting anywhere. And the second question is, um, does it work the other way round? If companies get the gender situation a bit better, is that likely to improve the situation um, for the LGBT community? So in answer to your second question, I would think so, but I have no proof that that's the case. But yeah, I think if you, if you really do you know, get the time allocation right, get people focused on an agenda, get it measured, then probably you can expand the agenda. The, the way these young women judged it was simply the quality of the LGBT networks. <coughs> because at a lower level in the organization, that's very important. There are plenty of LGBT networks. The problem with them is twofold. Certainly in banks, in financial institutions, they have basically migrated into um, mo most people from so-called back office functions as opposed to front office functions. And really good ones have a broad cross-section and importantly have a lot of straight allies on them. Lots of people who are straight come to the LGBT networks. Uh, and you can tell whether they're going to go nowhere based on, on that sort of uh, representation. Uh, hello, and thank you again for your, uh, dis your lecture and discussion here today. My question is related to uh, yourself as a role model presently, and those 722 people who you mentioned who may have a representative like you amongst them, what would your message be to them? Well, I think, uh, you know, many people say, well, when you, if you come out or not, it's a matter of your own business, and that is true. Uh, that is true. But as you are, a, when, when you're a leader, you actually are sharing part of yourself. And so you've got to think about, and I wish I'd thought about it properly, what happens if you're not authentic? You actually have to demonstrate to people that you're a role model. And so uh, I think uh, my message to them is you need to be authentic. You need to come out. And what's more, what I've observed with one or two of the CEOs who have come out in smaller companies is they were out already, and when they were CEO, they, they almost lived in the reverse to start with, and they came out again, having once felt comfortable in the job 
that they got. And I think it's partly to do to sort of say to them, well, I'm testing out whether this is good for my customers or whether it becomes my principal feature of my, um, my position. And, and they try and put it in a different place. And, and so, you know, you do get very odd responses uh, from the PR departments of companies that the very few companies that have out gay CEOs, um, eventually they, 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 they put it into perspective. I think you sort of started to answer this, but what advice would you give now to your younger self? It's a wonderful question uh, because it, this advice, of course, is, is not relevant. And so I could say, I would say to everybody, if in doubt, just come out. And I think in today's environment, I would say do that. And I'd say it to myself because first, you don't want to build this edifice of two lives. You really don't because it's very difficult to get out of it. It really is. And it's, it's, it, it does take a lot of energy. And that energy you could deploy creating relationships and things like that. It may not take away from people say, well, you were pretty successful, weren't you? And I say, well, the bit you saw, the other bit wasn't very successful. So I think I'd say, come out. Uh, if in doubt, come out. I just check, make sure that there was enough people receiving uh, you uh, and uh, to do it. But it's difficult to replay history because I'd have to transpose 50 years to the present. It's quite difficult. Um, if you were proactive in um, 2005, it's a bit hypothetical, do you think you could have uh, continued your tenure? Maybe it wouldn't have been that. Um, it's a good question. I don't know. I have a feeling, I have a feeling it would have caused a huge amount of press coverage, gigantic, and whether or not that would have undermined my position, I don't know. Either way. Though, really. either way. Uh, what I'm sure about is this, because many people ask me, they say, well, surely if you're out, you can't do business with, and then put a list, President Putin, Mr. Musevi, you know, uh, good luck, Jonathan. You know, the list is long. But actually, that's not true. I think in reality, when if you're senior, first of all, you get a pass anyway. And secondly, it may be a reason not to do business with you, but there has to be a much bigger reason underlying it. So they may use it as an excuse uh, on a margin, but actually, you probably don't want to do the business anyway. So. Whether that was the case in 2005, I, I don't know. I, I would expect I had a very interesting uh, dinner reasonably recently at the Russian embassy with a very nice Russian uh, ambassador who, who proceeded to tell me uh, after a few drinks that, of course, they knew all about me, which didn't surprise me, <laughs> um, and that they'd known all about me for a very long time, which didn't surprise me either. And then he said, you know, because we always knew you were going to be CEO of BP, and that was in the 90s. So I thought to myself, well, they obviously knew about me. I mean, why wouldn't a good uh, intelligence service know that? Uh, and uh, I continued to do business with Mr. Putin for a very long time, for uh, seven years. So. There are no more comments or questions. I'm going to hand over to Rebecca. John, thank you for listening very much. Well, thank you for listening. Thank you. So thank you, John, for a really thought-provoking talk this evening um, and being so open with us. Um, as a small token of our appreciation, I have a, a gift for you, um, which is to remind you of Maddingley. It's a history of the hall, um, of the gardens, and some of our royal connections here at Maddingley Hall. So thank, thank you, you very once much. again. Thank you. Thank you. So just to conclude, um, I'd also like to thank Boris for chairing and also many of my colleagues for helping um, with the organisation this evening. 
Um, and of course to all of you, thank you for coming. Um, and I hope that you will be back here soon, uh, whether it's for a future Maddingley lecture, maybe for a Maddingley concert, or to study with us. Um, so you should all have um, a brochure on your seat which gives you just a flavour of some of the courses that we run here at the Institute of Continuing Education. There's other information available on the gallery as well. Um, and there are opportunities that are mentioned in the programme on your seats um, to come back perhaps for the Festival of Ideas in November. Um, so please do have a look and see whether you'd like to come back. The next Maddingley Lecture, just for your information, is on the 26th of November. Um, and then Professor Andrew Wallace Hadrill will be talking on Pompeii and Herculaneum, Does the Past Have a Future? You'll be very welcome to join us then. Um, so I'd like to wish you um, a good evening um, if you're leaving us at this point. There are copies of uh, The Glass Closet for purchase on the gallery if you'd like to. Um, uh, so thank you, have a safe journey home. If you have an invite to stay back, then please do just gather here and we'll be ready for you shortly. So thank you very much.